So um, we're going to be looking at uh, gain and loss upside down tonight, and uh, next week we'll look we'll look at gain and loss right side up. Um, and this is this is an important topic because it's really going to help us with uh, understanding why we do what we do, why others do what they do, why we relate to each other. Uh, the ways that we do. Um, for some of you, this will be a somewhat familiar presentation, um, but um, I hope to dig into a few points uh, a little bit more um, than usual if I'm just going through things with, a, with an audience. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your blessings. What a good God you are. And Lord, we just ask for you to open our eyes, help give us wisdom and understanding that uh, we might see how we function or dysfunction. And, um, and in seeing it, may we understand. And in understanding, may we uh, be able to intelligently surrender to and cooperate with you in the process of transformation that we might be free. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, um, yes, looking at this particular topic, um, this is coming out of the, the Law of Life uh, book. And um, looking at this idea, we had looked last time, it was a couple of weeks ago, um, we had looked at... Um, not, you know, how do you not take things personally when things happen to us? And and if you miss that, you can go back to um, the videos on our YouTube channel, New Paradigm Ministries YouTube channel, and uh, you can check out the former uh, play, uh, the former group sessions in their entirety with all the Q and A along with it. Or I'll cut out the presentations and have them separately as a separate. Uh, video without all the Q&A, uh, that's there and available as well. Um, and uh, anyway, so you can you can find the ones that we've done previously. And uh, we were looking at, uh, you know, a few different lies that we believe. And this particular lie is the, is the belief that it's mine, right? that something belongs to me. Uh, from a Christian standpoint, we understand that nothing belongs to us. Everything belongs to God. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything that there is. He says all the gold and the silver is mine. Um, but we don't treat things as if they belong to him. We treat things as if they belong to us. And we see it as if the things belong to us. And so we treat things as if they belong to us. And so that becomes a problem. You know, so here's a scenario where you you're buying a present for somebody, <clears throat> and that is a present for somebody that you you love, you cherish, um, and you want just to get the perfect present for them, and uh, you know, and so you go shopping all over the place. You finally find it. It's expensive. You it takes a few months of savings in order for you to be able to purchase this present. And uh, whatever the day or the occasion comes, it's an anniversary, Christmas, birthday, something, and it's time to give that present. And so you come and you, you knock on the door and they come and they open the door and you hand them their present and they take that present. And as many of you recognize, they take that present and they throw it on the ground and they stomp on it and they slam the door in your face, not on your face, but, you know, right in front of you. Well, how does that make you feel? Well, <clears throat> some people feel angry, others feel crushed, others feel rejected, others feel upset, others feel um, um, 
devalued. There's all different ways that, that individuals feel in this particular scenario. Well, the next scenario helps to clarify things. Uh, you're a OOPS driver and you've been driving for OOPS for a long time and uh, you enjoy your job and you know you, you, you are driving on a route one day and you stop off at a particular residence, you get the package for that home and you go up to the door and you knock on the door and, and the resident comes out and you have them sign for the package and they sign for it and they you hand them the package and they take it and, and of course, what do they do? They throw it on the ground and they stomp on it and they slam the door. Well, how do you feel in that scenario? Well, uh, in that scenario, many individuals um, <clears throat> are, uh, you know, they're looking at, <laughs> they're looking at it and they're going, well, that's interesting. I wonder what's wrong with them. They might be curious, they might be cautious, but they're not taking things all the same way that they were before. And the question is why? What is the difference between the first scenario and the second scenario? Uh, why is it that I'm all upset or I'm uh, angry or I'm frustrated or I'm crushed or I'm in despair or I feel rejected in the first scenario, but I really don't in the second one? Well, the main reason is because we think it's mine, right? That was my present. It was purchased with my money. It represents my love. And that was my loved one. And in the second scenario, well, it's, it's not mine, right? I'm just working. And while I'm working, I'm doing this and I'm delivering this package. So it's not my present and it wasn't purchased with my money. In fact, while they are crushing that present or that gift or whatever that box was, while they're crushing it, I'm still earning money. And it's not my love and that's not my loved one. So to the degree to which I believe that it's mine is the degree to which I take it personally the degree to which I feel hurt and upset and crushed and rejected and so on when that present is not treated the way that I thought that it should be. But the degree to which I believe that it's not mine is the degree to which none of that is true because it's not mine. <clears throat> in the first scenario, I see myself as the owner. And in the second scenario, I see myself as the steward. And of course, we're not talking about presence and throwing presence on the ground. We're talking about heart. We're talking about relationships. So how often is it in a relationship with somebody else that we're upset? How often is it in a relationship with somebody else that, that I'm feeling crushed or I'm feeling rejected and so on because of what somebody else has said and what somebody else has done? Well, one of the reasons that I do is because I believe that it's mine. I believe that it's mine. I'm the owner. That's a problem. Now, another reason, if the present is rejected or crushed or other things like that, that I respond uh, in the way that I do is because I didn't receive what I expected. You see, human love gives in order to receive. It invests. It puts something of value in someone else in order to get something of greater value in return. I might put in uh, attention but I'm looking for more attention in return. I might put in time, but I'm looking for belonging. I might put in uh, paying for a dinner or buying a teddy bear or roses or other things of that nature, but I'm looking for acceptance. And so I put something of value in, but I'm looking to get something of greater value back. That's human love. That's how we function in human love. We give with the expectation of something in return. And if we don't get the return that we were looking for, well, things don't go very well. And if we get some return, well, okay, that might be okay, just as long as it's, it, it meets at least our minimum level of expectations. But if it doesn't meet that minimum level of expectations, if it's below the level of our expectations, now we got problems. We got significant problems. Now, we recognize in our human interactions that nothing's free. Nothing's free because everything has strings attached. Everything has strings attached. Everything and everyone has strings attached with it. So, no gift comes without a good punishment if it's not 
um, received well, <laughs> you know, there's something that goes along with it. You have somebody that just knocks on your door that you've never met before that just moved into the neighborhood and they introduce themselves and then they hand you a $20 bill and then they walk away. So you're here, you use this for whatever you want. What are you thinking? Well, you know, some people are thinking, well, this is a nice guy and a nice person. Um, and, uh, you know, but most people are thinking, well, what's the catch? What do they want? Because everybody knows somebody gives something away with some kind of expectation. Now, what if they handed you a suitcase full of $100 bills? Well, bigger gift, different expectation. So if you had the opportunity from the stranger to either receive the $20 bill or the suitcase, which one would you take? Well, there's some people that would take the suitcase very gladly. And there's others that would take the $20 bills rather than the suitcase. And there's some people that wouldn't take either. Right? Why? Well, because we recognize that every gift comes with strings attached. Every gift comes with strings attached. Now, that is true in humanity. And that is true in human love. And that is how we operate. That's how we operate. There is always some kind of expectation of return. And how much you need in return is dependent upon your expectations. Higher expectations need to have higher returns. Lower expectations can have lower returns. But everybody is looking for a return on whatever gift or whatever attention, whatever, whatever that they're giving away. But we don't necessarily think of it from that standpoint right? We think of it that as being generous, right? So I pay attention to somebody and I'm doing so because I'm being generous, or I am going to give a teddy bear to somebody because I'm being generous, or I, you know, we think of it from the standpoint of being generous, but, but where do you find out whether you're, you were actually really being generous or not? You find out when there's no return. You take the teddy bear and you give them the teddy bear and the teddy bears ends up in the trash can. Well, that's when you find out whether your gift was truly for them or whether it was actually for you. If you gave the gift for them and the teddy bear ends up in the trash can, you don't take it personal. You don't get upset for yourself. You don't hurt for yourself because they did that. Now, you might be concerned for them, right? and, uh, you know, and wonder what's going on in their life and why is it that the teddy bear that you gave them would end up in the trash can and, you know, seek to understand thought processes and stuff. So your concern would be for them, but not for yourself. You don't take it as a personal offense. You gave it to them. It's theirs. They can do whatever they want to with it. Yeah. All right. So how many of you, and you don't have to raise your hands, you don't have to signify in chat or whatever. This is just a, you know, question. How many of you, have ever given a gift to somebody else. And then when they didn't use the gift as you thought that it should be used, you tried to control them to use the gift the way that you thought it should be used, or you used the gift to try to control them in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in our home, um, I, uh, let, let me not name... <laughs> name individuals. Anyway, so so um, we have a family member. We have an extended family that lives in our home. Uh, it's not just myself and my wife and my children. Um, but anyway, so, so some of um, other residents of the home might buy presents for the children, like bicycles or, or other things of that nature. And then sometime later might threaten to take the bicycle away from them if they're not treating it the way that the individual or individuals think that it should be treated or you know or whatever and and uh, all right so hang on didn't you give it to them yeah if you gave it to them then isn't it theirs well yeah so if it's theirs then why are you talking about taking it away from them right because you gave it to or did you not give it to them was it a gift or was it not a gift is it just a tool for manipulation? Well, if it was a tool for manipulation, thank you for the tool for ma of manipulation. You can have it back, you know. But was it a gift? If it was a gift, okay. Well, then they can they can treat it however they want to treat it. It's their own responsibility between them and God how they treat it because it actually belongs to God, not you. 
and not them. <laughs> See, we, woo, we got things so mixed up, so twisted around in our heads. We got so many things backwards. So let's get deeper into the backwards and how things we got things backwards. So the heart, the heart, I'm not, we're not talking blood pumping muscle. We're talking about the part of the mind, which uh, we're, we're told that is the citadel of the man. Uh, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And, uh, and he's talking about the mind. You don't have a treasure in your cardiovascular pump. It's a treasure in your mind. And by that treasure, by that, um, that treasure, we, we make decisions. What kind of decisions? Oh, all kinds of decisions. And those decisions are made based upon basically two criteria. One is gain and the other is loss, right? So we have the option when we evaluate anything to look at it from a value basis, that's how we evaluate things from a heart standpoint is a value basis. And we look at it and we value different things. We value people, we value relationships, we value possessions, we value uh, animals, we value uh, uh, concepts like, you know, freedom and uh, responsibility and other types of things like this. And so, so we value everything. And then we make a decision based upon the value associated with that decision as we evaluate it, right? And we are created in such a way that we always go after gain and we always seek to avoid loss. And, uh, and so that's how God created us. He created us to always go for the gain and always to avoid the loss. And uh, of course, if you've got two doors, if you're stuck in a room, and the, and the only way out of the room is either the brown door or the black door. That's it. And there's no drinking fountain, no food, no bathroom, no nothing in the, that room that you're in. And the only way that you can go out is if you go out the brown door, you'll get paid $1,000. But if you go out the black door, you're going to pay $1,000 to go out. Which door are you going out? Well, of course, we're going to go out the brown door. Why? Because we always choose a gain over a loss. If we are confronted with a gain, and a loss at the same time, then we're always going for the gain. We're always avoiding the loss. Now, if you go out the brown door, you'll get paid $1,000. If you go out the black door, you'll get paid $10. Which door are you going out? Well, of course, we're going out the brown door because if you're confronted with two gains, you're always going to choose the greater gain over smaller gain. That's just, just how we function, right? Now, if you're confronted between two losses, in order to get out of this room, you're either going to pay $1,000 to go out the black door or $10 to go out the brown door. Which one are you going out? Well, of course, you're going out the brown door because we're always going to choose a smaller loss over a greater loss. And again, Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that treasure is the system by which you evaluate the relative value of various different things and whether it is a gain, whether it is a loss, and how much of a gain and how much of a loss that it is. And when you take all of that combination of values together, then that's going to determine the decision of what you're going to do. <clears throat> are you going to actually do this thing or are you not going to do this thing? And that's a function of the heart. Uh, for example, if you're going on vacation or you have the opportunity or the option to go on vacation, well, there's a lot of things you might consider. Do I lose this vacation, vacation time if I don't take it now? Well, if I do, then that might lean me in the direction of taking it versus leaving it behind. Or do I get money if I don't take the vacation time? Like, does that turn actually into wages if I don't take the vacation time? Well, I might want the money. That might be a greater value to me than the time. Uh, how much pressure is there at work? Do I really want to get away from it? Um, it? What kind of project is happening at the time? How many people are working upon that project? What kind of timeline is associated with it? Can I afford to take the, the you know, is there going to be a big raise for those that complete this project? And if I go on vacation now, I'm not going to get that raise because I won't be a, you know, a, a part of that project and whatever. So, you know, all of these are things that we evaluate and we put value to each of those different things. And finally, we pull it all together in a single value and we go, OK, is it gain or is it loss? Is it gain to go and loss to stay or is it gain to stay and loss to go? And however that valuation comes out, that's how we make our decisions.
So we, we make our decisions based upon value from a heart standpoint. And because our heart works that way, and again, I'm talking about the mind, I point here, but <laughs> we're talking about the mind. Because the heart works that way, then when it comes to temptation, that means that the enemy cannot tempt us to lose because loss is no temptation. So again, if I offer to you poison, and it's going to kill you slowly, it'll be very painful while you die, and it will take a long time, and there's no antidote for it, and uh, it also tastes really horrible, and it's just going to be absolutely miserable. Want some? Well, you might be saying, well, let me think about that for a little while. I mean, do you really have to think about it? Do you have to pray? No, I mean, the answer is no. Obviously, no. Because loss is no temptation. So, of course, if the enemy was coming along and he was uh, tempting Eve, <clears throat> well, it wouldn't have been smart to come like this and, and you know, to look pretty hideous and ugly and, and to present before her and say, you know what, here, eat this fruit. Uh, you'll die. You'll lose everything that you love. Uh, you'll begin to decay, other things will as well. You'll learn about death and dying and disease and, and, and all this misery and, and murder and all sorts of horrible hellish stuff. It'll be yours if you eat it. Here, want some? Well, no, of course not. That would be foolish. And he's smarter than that. So what he has to do is to trick us into believing that loss is gain and gain is loss. Can you see how powerful this would be? If, if everything that we do is filtered by gain and loss, if everything that we do is evaluated by a value system, at least as far as the heart is concerned, is evaluated by a value system so that everything that we choose to do is associated with gain and everything that we avoid is associated with loss, what would happen? If our whole evaluation system got turned upside down, what would happen? Hmm. Well, then we would pursue loss thinking that it was gain. And we would avoid gain thinking that it's loss. That is the problem. That's the problem. That's our problem. You see, in the Garden of Eden, God said, if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you're going to lose, you're going to die. And of course, the opposite, which wasn't spoken, but is implied in that statement is that if you don't eat it, you're going to gain, right? You'll get to live and, and you know, grow and, and mature and, and whatever, have a, have a good life that God had, had desired for you. <clears throat> and then in Genesis chapter three and beginning in verse one says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God made. And it wasn't the serpent. It was Satan in the serpent. Right. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Right. Well, and the woman said to the serpent, all right, well, yeah, we can eat. But the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Right. Then, then the serpent said to the woman, okay, well, I understand that, but I came to this tree months ago and I ate its fruit. And the moment that I ate its fruit, I got the ability to think and to reason and to perceive and to, to speak. And, and I have powers now that I didn't even know were possible beforehand. It, it, you know, my mind has opened up to things that I couldn't even possibly imagine beforehand. And God knows that you are so much greater than me at your creation so that when you eat of this fruit, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You'll be like God. You will not surely die. That was the first lie. You won't die, right? You can, you can disconnect from God, and you can be your own God and not die. You can keep yourself alive. You can disconnect from the source of life, from the source of power, and you can still live. That's a lie. For God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So God said, you eat it, you lose. The enemy said, ah, you eat it, you gain. God said, you don't eat it, you gain. And the enemy said, ah, no, you don't eat it, you lose. <clears throat> 
So God set up a system of evaluation, and he created Adam and Eve with that evaluation system created into them. Intrinsically, it was a part of their nature. To evaluate things according to the right standard, which is the standard that God gave them, so that they saw gain as gain and loss as loss, and there was no reason ever for Adam and Eve ever to choose loss, and there was no reason for them not to choose gain. God created them for gain forever. How is it that Adam and Eve created intrinsically in harmony with God and his will and his evaluation system who could only go after gain and could only avoid loss? How is it that they could come into a position where they could get that wrong? It is only by self-deception, only by self-deception. It was only when Eve deceived herself into believing a lie, a lie that took her evaluation system and turned it upside down. So that now, instead of seeing things right side up, she saw them upside down. Instead of seeing gain as gain, she sees gain as loss. And instead of seeing loss as gain, she, I mean, seeing loss as loss, she sees loss as gain. And so she automatically goes after the loss, thinking that it's gain, because that's how she's created. She's created to go after the gain, but it's the deception that causes her to go after it, thinking she's going after, going after the loss, thinking she's going after gain. She could never have gone after loss if she had not been deceived. But now in her deception, she goes after loss naturally. And what does it say in, in the next verse? So when the woman saw that the tree was good. Oh, see, she's still going after good. She was created for good. She was created for righteousness. She was created for truth. She was created for all these things. But now she believes the lie to be the truth. So she's still going after what she thinks is truth, but it's actually a lie. She's going after what she believes is good, but it's evil. She's going after what she believes is pleasant, but it's misery. She does, she's going after what she believes is wisdom, but it's foolishness. And she can't help but take of its fruit and eat it because she thinks that it's gain and she always has to do what is gain. So everything is backwards, everything is upside down, everything is chaotic. And here is Eve upside down, but she still thinks she's right side up. She's upside down, but she thinks she's still right side up. That's the deceptive nature of sin. And with her arms laden with that fruit, she goes to Adam. And she tells him the same stuff that the enemy told her. So she becomes an agent of Satan to bring the lies to Adam. And Adam's like, uh-uh. Like she was tricked into thinking that this was actually a snake that actually ate from the tree, that actually was doing good and actually knew what it was talking about. Adam knew. This is the enemy that we were warned about. And you've eaten the forbidden fruit. Oh, no. Mm -mm -mm. But guess what? Adam, too, deceived himself, deceived himself into thinking that Eve was a greater gift and a greater value than God and the angels and the garden and everything else that God had created to him, and, uh, and that he could not live without Eve, and he thought, well, She's alive. She's not dead. She's eaten the fruit. She says she loves me more than she did before. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's true. And he deceives himself. And he eats the fruit too. Now the father and the mother of our race are upside down. And guess what? Every one of us are born upside down with this upside down evaluation system where we believe that we're like God. So you throw within this now evaluation system, 
Human love, which is upside down and backwards, which gives in order to receive, which is an investment, right? We put something of value in to get something of greater value back. And if that is my gain, I mean, if that's my love and that's what I do, and my evaluation system is upside down, then my gain is to receive. That's why I gave. I give in order to receive. And the more I can receive, the more gain that I have. I mean, come on, you, somebody gives you a Christmas present and the Christmas present has $2 in it. Well, that's great. $20 in it, that's better. $200, that's even better. $2,000, that's even better. $2 million, woohoo, hallelujah. Jumping around, $2 billion, whoa, don't even know what to do with that, right? So the more you receive, the greater gain that you have. But at least if you receive enough, if this is coming from Aunt Matilda and you know Aunt Matilda dishes out $5, to everybody in the family tree. And so what are you expecting? You're expecting $5. So when the card opens and there's $5, well, that's what you expected. That's fine. That's enough. I mean, it's not huge, but eh, eh, thank you. But if, if you, what happened if Aunt Matilda's always dishing out $5,000 every Christmas to every family member and everybody else gets $5,000 and you get $5 this year? Well, what about that? Well, you feel like you're at loss. Why? Because you just received less than what you expected, <clears throat> right? Now you're at loss, but are you at loss? Well, no, you didn't have the $5 before you got it. And now you got it. Now you have $5 more than you had before. That's a gain, but you consider it a loss because it's less than what you expected. So it's your expectations that divide the line between whether it's a gain or whether it's a loss. And of course, what's worse than receiving less than what you expected or receiving nothing at all. And even worse than that is having your treasure taken away. So here's the heart. Here's human love. This is how we operate. And it's upside down. It's backwards. It's already messed up all the way from conception through the development process into birth and the growth and development. This is how we are born. This is our nature. This is how we operate ever since the fall. Not how God created us, but how we operate since the fall. And of course, you take this and you throw it into a relationship context and you have, I mean, there are some really beautiful parts, very beautiful parts of, of this backwardsness, right? That's what can, kind of keeps us in the deception for a while. I mean, you have a young man, young woman, they run into each other. There's this kind of zzz, zzz thing that happens. And, you know, there's an attraction, at least from one side, you're hoping from both sides. Um, and, uh, you know, if he's interested in her, then what do you do? Well, if you've got this kind of love, then you're going to give. So you got to give something if you want to receive anything back. And so you got to give some attention to receive some attention. And you might give a uh time right uh in order to receive belonging you might uh give some vulnerability right opening up about your life and what you you know uh things that they could potentially stomp on and take advantage of but you know to in order to be a bit vulnerable you got to open up that vulnerability and hoping that they are, they'll open up as well and be vulnerable as well, because if there's vulnerability from the other side, then there's something that you can control. And, uh, <laughs> right. Uh, anyway, so, so, and, you know, so walks get longer and talks get more deep and uh, get deeper and, uh, um, you know, teddy bears get bigger and flowers get more and it just progresses and it's just wonderful. And, and your expectations just go up and up and up and up because the giving gets higher and the expectations get higher and the giving higher and the expectations higher and giving higher and expectations higher and so on and so on until you're just high, right? Uh, so high, you can't see all of the red flags that everybody else sees. And they're like, well, what they see in that person, you know, so that's, yeah. Anyways, yeah, some of us have been there. Uh, so, so uh, yeah. And then you know, eventually somebody's like, "Well, you know what? I, 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 I think that they're a permanent gain." Well, if you think they're a permanent gain, then you've got to you've got to try to get them to be on your side permanently, right? And so that's a marriage commitment. So there has to be, you know, that that question and uh, that important question of uh, "Will you marry me?" 
And, uh, you know, you're hoping that you're number one on their list, because if you're number one on the list, not the hit list, but number one on the good list, then then that means an automatic yes. Yes, they're going to say yes, because they're, they're always going to go after the greater gain. And if you're number two on the list, well, they've, they're going to hold off for number one. And once it looks like number one is not coming around, then they'll go for number two, because number two comes up on the number one list and, and so on. And you're always going for number one. And, uh, and so this is how we think. We think and we evaluate everything from a value basis. That's how we take everything from a value basis. And so he proposes, she says yes. The engagement goes on. They get married, right? Now what happens with the valuation system? Well, now you have secured the treasure, right? You don't have to get the treasure. You have secured the treasure. That's what marriage does. Marriage secures the treasure. Now she's mine. Now he's mine. We were trying to make each other ours during this whole dating process, but now we are. We are mine, right? So now what happens to that valuation system? All right, so uh, I don't have to spend as much time and attention in keeping what I already have, which is already mine and uh, and secured. So, so the time and attention goes down, and the gifts get smaller, and the poems get fewer in between, and... And, you know, everything that happened in the dating relationship starts turning in reverse in after marriage and, and it just gets less and lower and less and lower. And, and if you had raised your expectations up to here because of their giving, you know, and now their giving starts decreasing and it gets below the level of your expectations, well, what do you do? Well, the only way you can mitigate your losses here is to lower your expectations. And then they give less and then you lower your expectations and then they give less and then you lower your expectations and less and lower and less and lower and less and lower until eventually you get to a point where you say well you know what enough is enough i'm not lowering my expectations anymore so if 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 your expectations are here and their level of performance is down here well obviously now you're in loss that relationship is a loss because it's below the level of your expectations. And anything below the level of your expectations is a loss. So what are you going to do with a loss? Well, you can try to fix it, right? So you can have one of those conversations and trying to fix them through that conversation uh, to convince them to do better and give more and be more loving and to pay attention to you and, you know, and other things like that, take you on dates and remember that, you know, and, and whatever. And if they do, if, you know, if they start giving above the level of your expectations, well, great, that was, you know, you consider that to be a successful intervention. But if they don't, if they continue down here and your expectations are still up here, then you have to try to get some other way to control or manipulate them so that you can get them to get above the level of your expectations. And if that doesn't happen, well, what do you do? Well, you can you can separate, right? You can live two different homes. I mean, two different lives in the same home. You can get different bank accounts, different bedrooms, different beds, different, you know, and whatever, still living together. Or you can separate living spaces too. And you can, you know, separate, separate, or you can divorce or, or you can go looking for another game. These are all the options that are available to an individual in that situation where they're, they're stuck in that gain loss pattern, but the whole evaluation system is upside down. And and so, so here with this upside down evaluation system, well, I believe that it's mine, right? I'm the owner. It's, it's my possession. I have it. It's mine. I can produce it. I'm the originator, the creator of whatever this thing is, like love, right? It's my love that I'm giving away. When you say to somebody, I love you, what does that mean? What does it mean? Does it mean that you love them? Or does it mean, I want you to love me? Well, you don't necessarily know as long as they continue saying, I love you. But if you say, I love you, and they say, okay. And you say, I love you, and they say, whatever. And if you say, I love you, and they say, well, that's your problem. And if you say, I love you, and they say, well, you need to get your head checked. Well, if every time you say I love you, you get some kind of response like that, which is nothing near I love you too. Well, how long are you going to say I love you? Well, not very long. Most people are not going to say I love you very long because I love you is not a statement of fact. Oh, I love you. This, I love you is a request for I love you too, right? Because human love 
gives in order to receive. So I love you is for the purpose of receiving I love you too. So I believe that I can possess it. I The love is mine. So now I can produce it. It comes from me. And now I am my own to do whatever I want to with me. So now I can give it away in order to get more. That's our, our kind of basic understanding. This is how we, how we function, how we operate. All right. Now, what's the foundation or the foundational characteristic under believing and under this idea that I have something, I possess it, it's mine. Well, it's actually selfishness. Well, I mean, again, we talked about it earlier. How much of what you have belongs to you? Zero. It all belongs to God. But what if you treat it as if it belongs to you? Well, then it still belongs to God. And so if it belongs to God, but you treat it as if it belongs to you, then that's selfish. It's like the kids in the, the sandbox, you know, the one, the one has the truck and the other one comes along and says, mine, takes it away and, and plays with it as if it's theirs and won't let the other kid who actually had it in their possession, won't let them play with it, you know? So you'd say that kid is selfish. Well, it's true for people too, right? So selfishness underlies this. And what underlies the, I can produce things on my own and I am my own to do whatever I want to with me? Well, that's pride. That's pride. So the, the basic fundamental foundational motivations of this heart of human love, which is upside down and backwards, that gives in order to receive, whose gain is to receive more and loss is to not receive enough or to receive nothing or to lose your treasure. And who believes that it's mine, the underlying motivation of this heart is selfishness and pride. That's it. That's all it's got. It can't produce anything else other than selfishness and pride. And it can't help but go after loss thinking it's going after gain. And it can't help but avoid gain thinking that it's avoiding loss. It can't help it. It can't help it. What did I say? It can't help it. You can't help being like this you can't help being like this this is how you and i are born and this is the nature that we're born with we can't help it now let me ask you this <clears throat> if you had a uh, if uh, if you were born Back in the days when they were slavery, there was slavery. And you were born into a family of slaves. Would you be guilty for having been born a slave? Would there be guilt for that? Well, no, of course not. Because you can't control it. There is no guilt for what you cannot control. <clears throat> there is only guilt for that which you can control. <clears throat> would you be guilty for growing up a slave? Well, the answer is no. You wouldn't be guilty for growing up a slave because you can't help but be a slave and remain a slave. You don't, you're not a slave by choice. Not like you said, okay, yeah, enslave me. That's not what slavery is. Right? Slavery is not a choice. That's the whole nature of slavery. It's the lack of choice to be free, just like being a prisoner, <clears throat> right? So, <clears throat> and I mean, we might say, okay, well, with prisoners, they had a choice, and then that got them into prison. Now they don't have any choice. And slavery, it was without a choice to get into it or to stay in it, right? Okay, so we'll just take the slavery analogy. So there's no guilt for having been born a slave. There's no guilt for growing up a slave. And there's no guilt for continuing to be a slave. Until, until what? Until you are offered freedom. And you understand the offer, of the offer of the freedom. And you can take the offer of the freedom. But you leave it alone and you, you, you choose to remain in, in slavery. That's when guilt comes. Or you choose to go free. And 
then you choose to go back into slavery. Right? Yeah, there's guilt for that. Um, <clears throat> so is there guilt for you being upside down? Well, no, you were born that way. You were born into a family of upside down slaves to sinful fallen human nature who, who, who operate this way. Is there any guilt for having been this way? No, there's not. Is it dangerous? Yes. Will it kill you? Yes. Is it, will it harm others? Yes. Is it evil? Yes. Is it selfish and is it proud? Yes. Right. Does it have other ugly things along with it? Yes. But are you guilty for it? No. Not until you are offered the opportunity to go free. You understand Stand that opportunity and how you might cooperate with and you choose not to take it you choose to remain a slave that's when it becomes a problem a guilt problem but not until then and many of us are still here not because we know how to be free but because we're stuck and we're still a slave to this nature. Okay, well, let's learn how we can be free. Right. Let's learn how we can be free. Now, this heart is miserable. It's ugly. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like a filthy rags, and we all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Yes, that's what it's like. And what can it do? This heart can speak with the tongues of men and of angels. It can have the gift of prophecy it can understand all mysteries and all knowledge it can have all faith so that it could remove mountains it could bestow all my goods to feed the poor and even give my body to be burned it can do all that kind of stuff and still not have love real love and if not it profits me nothing this heart can can <clears throat> can say to god lord lord have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? So there is a lot of apparently good things that this heart can do. Because remember, it gives, so that looks generous. But it does so in order to receive back again. And it can't help it. That's what it does. That's its very nature. But can God take that nature? and take it to heaven and give you free reign of heaven with that selfish nature. Well, no, it would, it would muck up and destroy all of heaven. So no, he can't take that to heaven, but that's how we're born. So there has to be a transformation process. There has to be something. This, this life is a probationary time where God is giving us the opportunity by his grace and his plan of salvation in order to take us from what we have been, which we have no guilt for having been there and to transform us into what he created us for in the beginning so that he can freely let us enter back into heaven and the fellowship there, which is completely selfish and humble and not proud and not anything like what we're discussing today. But as long <laughs> as, long as we're still caught in that old thing, then he will declare, I, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Why? Because he can't let that into heaven. He can't. It would just destroy everything there. I mean, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So, so this mind, this heart that's upside down and backwards, it cannot even submit itself to the law of God. It can't. And so you take that and you put it in heaven, all it's going to do is chaos. It's going to disobey. It's going to go in the wrong direction, thinking it's going in the right direction. We're going to do the wrong things, thinking we're doing the right things. We're going to do the evil, thinking we're doing the good. We're going to be completely backwards and making chaos and havoc of everything. But yet still thinking that we're okay. Revelation 3.17, you, you say I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. It's true. We just don't see it. Don't see it very well. So here's this heart. And not only is it selfish, not only is it proud, but I believe that I'm God. Why? Well, because the only one in the universe that can give first is God. It's the only one that can give first. Right? Everyone else has to take first in order to have something to give. You can't give what you don't have. And it's only God that can just create it, and then he can give it. And so if I have a love that gives first in order to receive, then I must believe that I'm God. 
And I must believe that it that I am my own and that it comes from me and it's my possession. Oh, this is all God. I'm all God. I'm all backwards. And of course, the law tells us that you shall have no other gods before me. And of course, the big God that we have before him is the other trinity, me, myself, and I. That's what I want, what I desire, what I need. That comes first. Everything and everyone else comes somewhere down the line, including God. And this heart is a slave to others, right? So it's, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's interesting because when I separate from God, if God is my source, and that's how we're created, we're created with God as our source, Adam and Eve back at the beginning, right? Everything and perfection was created with God as a source and come and take God from God everything that you need and then give it away to others. That's how everything was created in the beginning. But now, if I believe that I'm God, if I deceive myself, like Adam and Eve in the garden, if I deceive myself into believing the lie that I can be God, then I detach from God, but I'm still dependent. I still need love. I still need water and food and all these different things. I still need acceptance and belonging and harmony and security and compassion and, uh, and, and truth and, you know, all these different things. I still need them. But if I have disconnected from God, then I've got to find another source for them. So guess what? I connect to others. So that's where I go to connect. And so I see other people as the source of what I need. And so I need acceptance. So I'm going to go to you for acceptance. I need belonging. I'm going to go to you for belonging. I need, um, uh, let's see, I need uh, harmony. You know, so I'm going to go to you so that we can get along. Uh, I need security. So I'm going to go to you so that you can be my security blanket. And, and, and so that's what we see other relationships as, other people as there in order to supply what I need. And that's why I give to receive, because I need what you have. And so I'm trying to get it from you. And the way that I can try to get it from you is to give that I might then be able to receive. And so everybody else is there for me to manipulate. That's what other relationships are for, are for me to manipulate so that I can try to get what I need from other people. And the reason that I have to manipulate is because I can't, I can't trust other people because they're not trustworthy. And I can't guarantee that they're going to give me what I want. So I've got to try to manipulate and control. You always have to try to manipulate and control a source that you can't trust. You always have to try to control and manipulate a source that you can't trust. And so if I have you as my source and I can't trust you, then I've got to try to manipulate and control you in order to get what I need. And that manipulation and that control might come from the good side, right? You know, so I'm going to, I'm going to say, oh, look how, you know, how nice you look today. And oh, that's a pretty dress. Did you wear that? Did you, have you ever worn that before? Yeah yesterday you know um and uh you know oh look your shoes match your dress and you know and what i i never i'm just saying that right now I, I don't think i ever noticed that um but that's just the guy side um <laughs> and uh you know so you know i can give compliments and i can give you a pat on the back and i can give you encouraging words and other things like that with the whole purpose of receiving those same things back again and as long as i give them and i receive them back again and it's enough according to my expectations then i'm okay life is good right as long as i'm manipulating and controlling and things are going the way that they're supposed to then i'm good i'm okay and i might not even know that i'm manipulating and controlling as long as things are going well but the moment it starts to tank and you don't respond to that well and you throw the teddy bear in the trash you stomp on the 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 flowers um you know uh, instead of getting in the car, you kick the car, uh, you know, whatever it is, <clears throat> things start going that way. Well, then I start taking it personal. I start getting frustrated, angry, upset, uh, rejected, feel at loss and all of these different things. Why? Because you, my source, are not behaving the way that I think that you should. You're not meeting my expectations. And now I'm at loss. And I can't help it. I can't help it. I can't control it. I can't really actually control you. I try, but I can't really do it. I try to control you, but I can't really control you. And so it gets really messy. 
And so if I try to control you, but I can't really control you, then I can't control my gains and my losses for real, for, for real. And so I'm always subject to loss when I don't want to be subject to loss. And I wasn't made for loss. And so I try to avoid it like a plague. <clears throat> now, you can try to control others by the bad side. And the bad side is guilt trips, threats, abuse, you know, things of that nature. It can get really dark. And some of you have been through the really dark. Some of us have been through dark, really dark of control and manipulation of others. But the one who is doing that sees the one that they're doing it to as the source of something that they think they need. And they're doing it in order to try to get from the other what they need or to keep them as a source. Because guilt is a powerful motivator. Fear is a powerful motivator. And so you can use guilt and you can use fear and you can use these negative emotions um, in order to try to manipulate others in order to keep them as your source. <clears throat> and so the one, <clears throat> excuse me, the one who, who uses that fear and that guilt and so on is a slave to the one that they do it to because they see that one as their source. And the one who is being done to and takes it and is manipulated by it also is the slave to the one that is doing it, right? So each one is a slave to each other. The abuser is a slave to the one they're abusing, and the one that's putting up with the abuse is a slave to the one that, they're, that is uh, abusing them, because each of them see each other as the source of what they need. It's a mess. It's a mess. Absolute mess. But it all goes along with gain and loss. All goes along with gain and loss. But when the gain and loss gets upside down, like you and I were born into, then it gets really messy because we can't actually control the gains and the losses because the gain and the loss is dependent upon whether somebody else behaves well and says well and thinks well and responds well. And if they don't do it well, then I'm at loss. And when we have this heart and when we have this thought process and this mentality, then we think that the only way that we can be well is if they are well. And so I can't tell you how many counseling appointments that I've had and sessions with others where I'm told how bad the other person is. And, you know, so I'm, I'm counseling with somebody and they're talking about the somebody else in their life and how bad that somebody else in their life is and how they say these things and don't do these things and they do do these things. And, and this is why I have the problems that I do because this person over here is not being well and they're being evil and ugly and all that kind of stuff. And if only they could be well and evil and I mean, if they could be well and good and nice and kind, then I wouldn't have the problems that I have. No, no. If you need them, then that's a problem. If you need them, then that's a problem. If you are dependent upon them, that's a problem. If you have to have them be well in order for you to be well, that's a problem. And you can never, ever guarantee that you will ever be well if you can only be well if somebody else is well. You're a slave to them and you can't be free. But that is not how God created you to be. 
And that is not where he will leave you through the plan of salvation. <clears throat> what God is seeking to do in each of our lives is to set us free from the whole upside down valuation system in our own hearts, our own minds, that sees things backwards, that sees gain where loss is and loss where gain is, that gets all this backwards where I give in order to receive, where I see things as my own, where I'm a slave to others, where I have to control and manipulate, but I feel controlled and manipulated in return, where I think others have what I need. And so I'm dependent upon them and I grasp onto them and I try to hold on to them and so on. Uh -uh. God in this plan of salvation is there to set us free from all of that problem that is inside. Even if not a single person or a single thing changes outside, you can be free even if no one else around you is. You can be free, even if no one else around you is. And that is the power of the gospel. The gospel can set you free from your problem. It's not guaranteed to set you free from their problems, or their problems, or their problems, or all of their problems. Only yours. He's a personal savior, and he's coming personally to set you free. And he has a way to set you free so that even if no one else around you changes, you can. Next week, we're going to look at gain and loss right side up. We looked at gain and loss today upside down, and it's miserable. It is. It's really miserable. Now, what does God think of you with this? slave heart that is backwards and thinks that you're God and you're selfish and you're proud and all that kind of stuff. Well, God isn't sitting there going like, oh man, you are such a mess. I can't believe this. This is just ridiculous. I mean, Gabriel, what are you thinking? I mean, shouldn't we just zap them all and just have this over with? I mean, is that what God's thinking? No, we are his children. He loves us. We are precious to him. He wants to set us free. He died and he lives now in order to set us free. He understands that we were born slaves and we can't help it. But we are precious to him. And he is not content to just leave us in that slavery. And so he's made a way to set us free. But most of us have not gone free because we just haven't understood. Yeah, we, yeah, we've been told he's been, you know, he's there to set you free, but we don't know how. No, yeah. right. We don't know how. It's there in the word. Let's study. Right. He's, he's made it available so that we can study and we can learn and we can understand how we can be free. I'll say this. It's a lot more simple. Than you think that it is because salvation in heaven was made for little children. Jesus said, unless you become as a little child, you can't enter into the kingdom of heaven because heaven was made for such as these. And so it can't be complex. It can't be a a really huge, big, complex type of type of thing. No, that's a simple thing. And so we need to bring down the simplicity. But also as adults, we get very complex in our thinking. And so we have to, I've got to also be able to address the complex questions and and so on that comes along in the process in order to then take it and then boil it back down so that we can get back down to the simplicity. What's the simplicity? Oh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him we might be saved. Jesus didn't have any of this that we're talking about tonight. None of it. He had a perfect life. His heart was right side up. His gain was lined up right with God's gain, and his losses were lined right up with God's losses. It was natural for him to 
to choose the right and to avoid the evil. He was never a slave to others. He had his father as his source. He never saw anything as belonging to himself. He was only the channel through which God's love and resources and power was transmitted to others. He was not dependent upon other people. He didn't need them. He was not dependent upon them. He needed his father and he depended upon his father. He lived everything that our life needed to be. And then he offers it to us freely as a gift of his grace, simply accepted by faith. And then it becomes yours. We're going to talk about that more in a, in a few weeks. Okay. We're, going to, we're going to look at that a bit deeper in a few weeks. Um, but just be, be assured God has a plan to set you free. But this is why what we're talking about tonight. This is why we do what we do and why we respond the ways that we do. It's all evaluation system. It's a hard issue. And that has to be changed and transformed before things can be made right and we can be in the right direction. Well, let's pray and then we'll get to our questions and answers. Dear Heavenly Father, what an awesome God you are. Thank you that you understand. Thank you that you did not just put us off. Thank you that you're not, you're not so disgusted by our very nature and our problems and the issues that are going on. No, patient and kind and you have a love that is everlasting and that you can bear all things and endure all things oh, praise god for that and lord we ask for you to save us do whatever you need to do everything you know you need to do in order to set us free do so Lord. but now what would you have us to do to cooperate with you in that process thank you lord for showing it to us and thank you for being faithful to carry to completion this work that you have begun in us already. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> so that was a lot to chew on. And um, so if anybody got questions, you can send them through. I got one here. And... Um, <clears throat> it says, I find myself disobeying my parents over a person. I'm not allowed to talk to this person, but I still want to. I have already contacted him a few times, but recently I contacted him and my parents have forbade me to have any interaction with him. I have a problem in obsessing over people and I really feel a sense of gain with staying in contact with him. <clears throat> my parents fully disagree, and I do feel a bit guilty and bad about it, but I still want to disobey. I wish I could make my own decisions and just still contact him if I want to. Please, what should I do? What can I do? Out of honesty, I don't want to, to obey. I still want to talk to him, even though it's obvious that the person does not have my best interest at heart. Mm. I feel so trapped, and I honestly don't want to don't know what to do i'm at my wits end hmm. so <clears throat> that's a yeah that's a real real deal right that's a that's definitely a a, a real issue all right so uh, looking at what we've looked at tonight let's apply it to this this situation okay. so you find yourself disobeying your parents over a person you're not allowed to talk to them but you still want to. And the question is, why do you want to? Do you want to talk to them for what you might give to them? Or do you want to talk to them for what you might receive from them? It's obvious from, from this and from human nature that what you're wanting is you're wanting to be able to receive something from the individual. So you think that the individual has something that you need, whether that's attention or acceptance or belonging or... Um, approval or understanding or whatever it is there's something there that the individual has that you think that you need and it's something that you're missing right. so it's like you're hungry and you haven't been eating and there's somebody over here and it looks like they've got a sandwich that you could eat on right. and so if you're hungry and you're really hungry well you turn to begging right. that's what people do if you get hungry enough you're going to turn to begging because you need food. Well, you need love. 
You need acceptance. You need belonging and harmony and security and all these different things. You need that love. And so you got to go somewhere and get it. And it's obvious that your parents are not the source that you need. Um, that's not sufficient. And it never will be, in fact. You know, uh, they can't be the source that you need. Um, they, they might be able to be a better source for you than they have been if they were connected more to God and taking more freely from him, and then they would have more of him to give to you. Um, <clears throat> but even, even so, it's not their responsibility to fulfill you. That's only God's responsibility. So your desire to connect and to contact the other guy is a manifestation of your need for God. Mm -hmm. So when you want to go and you want to talk to that guy, knowing that you shouldn't, or that you're not supposed to, right? um, when, you want, when you are drawn in that direction, that is a manifestation of your need for God. It's just misdirected because your heart's upside down. You see things backwards and you put gain where loss is and loss where gain is. But you need God. You need his love. You need his acceptance. You need all of that from him. And so recognize that, right? First of all, recognize that when you have the desire to go and connect with that other guy, that is really your need to connect with God. That is your need to connect with God and take from him everything that you need. That's really, that's really where it's at. And, um, and, and so recognize that and then go, okay, so if I'm longing to be with this individual or to communicate with this individual uh, and, uh, and I'm not allowed to, well, maybe that is a, a good motivation for me to, uh, to go and, uh, and attach to uh, to God, right? Take that as the time and the opportunity to go and attach to God, and that would be a good a good response. That would be a good response. Um, I'm just trying to pull up a slide here so that I can give an illustration of uh, something that I was just talking to somebody else about. Here we go. Uh, All right, and let me just share the screen here. All right, so here uh, you can see that there is a plant, right? And this plant has a root stalk, and there is a graft union. This is where the scion, which is the top part of the plant, has been grafted onto the root stalk, which is the bottom part of the plant that has the roots. Now, if you were to take this, this scion and you were to cut it off from the rootstock, would it continue to live? And the answer is no, it would die. You cut it off from the rootstock and it's going to begin dying. It will start the dying process right away. Now, what if you got this scion and you cut it off and you got another plant and you cut off its scion and you got the two scions, the two tops of the plants, and you grafted them together? Are they going to support each other's life, or are they both, both going to die together? Well, obviously, they're both going to die together. The only way that you can have life is if you're connected to the rootstock as a, as a scion. That's the only way that you can have life. And so <clears throat> that, that rootstock is Christ. And the scion is a person. And that graft union is union with Christ. And it is through the Holy Spirit coming and working through you and the pruning hand of the Father that the fruits of the Spirit are developed in your life and you can grow and so on. So your life comes from connecting with the rootstock. It does not come with connecting from, to another person. And if you just try to connect and you try to, try to graft yourself into another person, both of you are going to die. They'll both die. They'll kill each other. The only way you can live is connecting to the root stone. That's the only way. And so God is calling you to do so. He's calling you. He is allowing these circumstances to come so that you can recognize your longing is for him. 
because he's the only one that can fulfill those needs in your life. The only one. Now, it is not the rootstock that pushes the fluid through the scion. It is not Christ and the Holy Spirit that push what you need through you so that you might grow and live. It's you who takes it. It's the scion that takes what is made available to it by the rootstock and brings it into itself and then lives and grows by it. So how do you take from Christ? How do you take from God that you might be full? It's by faith. It's by faith. It's by belief. It's by faith and by belief that you take from God that which you need so that you can be full. <clears throat> God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. So, <clears throat> so his love is available when? It's available right now. It's available all the time. You have access to it anytime, anywhere, any situation, any circumstance. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened. Right? You're weary because you, you're feeling unloved. You're, you're burdened because you're, you're not fulfilled. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. What is, when do you rest? You rest when your needs are filled supply right you when you're loved and you're accepted and you belong and and you're confident and and you know that he loves you that's when you rest come unto me all you who are weary and burdened and i will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn of me for i'm humble and gentle in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light his promises are there and his promises are for you and they're here for, they're for you for right now. Take them, believe them, believe that God loves you. Don't wait until you feel it. Don't wait until you feel like it. Accept it because he says so and because he's trustworthy. And as you do so, then you'll have it. And when you have it and you fill up with the love of God, you won't long for the other stuff I mean. You won't long to connect with somebody that you're not supposed to connect with. Right? And, and you won't have that longing that causes you to want to drive past obedience to your parents to disobey. Right? It's not that you really want to obey, I mean, disobey your parents. No, that, that's not it. But it's that you have a need and it's not being met and you think that the need is being met over here. And so that's where you want to go to get it. Everybody, if they were starving because, the, because nobody was feeding them at home, if the parents said, don't go over there and get food, but you're starving to death, guess what? You're going to go over there and get food. <clears throat> yeah and so all right well yes but feed feed where you're supposed to which is god and when you learn to take from him and you learn to eat from him you learn to feed from him then that desire to go there will go away and you'll be okay then somebody might ask the question well what about other relationships i mean if i don't go to somebody else because i'm already full and I've already come from God and I've, you know, and I've taken what I need from him and I'm full. Well, then what's the point of other people? They're there for you to give to. They're there for you to give to. They're not there for you to take from. They're there for you to give to. You've taken some good things from God. That's okay. Give them away and give more away and take more and give more. You're happier when you take more and give more. And we'll talk more about that next week too. Okay. So here's a common, a sad situation in the world today is when parents need their children to affirm them. It's upside down. Well, yes. I mean, that's, that's been ever since the fall. I mean, <laughs> all right, come on, parents. We got parents here. How many parents have ever gotten frustrated because their children 
did not obey and behave like they wanted them to in public. And they had the thought or the feeling that that was going to bring some disrepute on the family and the family name. Both my hands up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Why? Because we see the behavior of the children reflecting back on ourselves. And we don't like the reflection. And we think that it damages our own reputation and whatever respect we might have with others and so on. And so we get on the children because the children's behavior is affecting our reputation. The frustration is not necessarily with the children, it's with our own issues. And yeah, sure, we, we as parents, we, we need our children for affirmation, we need them for love, we, we use them and manipulate them, everybody does. I mean, that's how, we're, that's how we're grown, I mean, that's how we're born, that's how we grow up, that's the nature that we have, this is the heart that we operate by, but this is what God is looking to save us from. Not to keep us here, but to save us from it. <clears throat> all right other questions i have a question okay all right go ahead so it's clear that the answer is christ that we need god but in this act of how we can't help how we are there are some relationships that seem to work even though they may not have God as the focal point of their relationship. So what do you attribute to that? <clears throat> uh, yes, you know, like um, the dating relationship, right? Um, the dating relationship is an, an, excellent, an excellent example of that, where you have two individuals that are selfish, two individuals that are giving in order to receive, but both of them are giving and both of them are receiving from each other. And so things are going fairly well from that standpoint. So <clears throat> a very dangerous situation in selfish human nature is a situation where you have a balance of selfishness. Right? That's a dangerous situation <clears throat> where you have a balance of selfishness, where you have one individual that is giving to the other with expectations of return, and you have the other that's giving to the other individual with expectations of return, and both of them are giving, and both of them are receiving, and so both of them are relatively satisfied. And, um, you know, and so in that situation, there's not a lot of contention. There's not a lot of rubbing heads. There's not a lot of, <clears throat> you know, the, the chaos and so on that's going on. And the reason that that is so dangerous is because in that situation, an individual rarely recognizes their need. They rarely recognize their need because to live in that kind of relationship where there's very, very little chaos and things seem to be working quite well over a period of years, decades, and so on in a relationship of that kind of nature. But if it's still from the foundation of selfishness and pride and having myself in the place of God, that selfishness and that pride and having myself in the place of God cannot translate into heaven. It can't. And so even an individual in that situation needs to be saved from the selfishness and the sin so that the motivation of their relationship is a motivation of unselfish love without expectations for myself with only expectations for the others <clears throat> and so in god's grace <laughs> he allows circumstances and situations to come where that gets disrupted where there becomes an imbalance and where an individual, there starts to be conflict and other types of things of that nature that happens. Now, I'm not saying it's always, you know, huge and, and whatever, but the times come, right? And the conflicts and the, and the disagreements come and, and so on. And well, praise God that they do, 
because those are our opportunities to see what's in the heart. I don't know what's in my heart when everything is going well. I don't. Because selfishness and selflessness can look really similar, really similar. And speak with the tongue of men and men angels and have not love, right? We can have all knowledge and all, know all mysteries and have all, you know, understand prophecy and, and so on. We can have faith so we can move mountains, but still not have love. We could give everything that, way that, we, that we have away. And we could surrender our body to be burned in the flames. We'd go down in a martyr's death and still not have love. Because selfishness and selflessness can look really similar when things are going well. But it's when things start to break down and not go well and not go the way that I want them to, that what's inside is really comes spilling out. So that I can then see what's inside. <laughs> So <clears throat> who are the ones that recognize that they have a need? It's the ones that are in chaos. It's the ones that are fighting. It's the ones that are bickering. It's the ones that are back and forth and all that kind of stuff. They see more clearly that they have a need. And sometimes they're the ones that are more, that are more easily reached. Jesus said, I came not for the well, but the sick. He said, I came not for the righteous, but the unrighteous. If I didn't come for you if you don't need me. It's only if you recognize that you have a problem that you then need me. And that's who I'm here for. But if you don't think you've got a problem and you don't need me, I can't help you. And uh, so, so yes, there can, there can be that situation, but it's a dangerous one. It's a dangerous one. <clears throat> How do I connect with Christ? That's an excellent question. Um, as I mentioned, it's by faith. Right? It's by belief. Now, every method is a method. Right? Connection is, is not a method. Connection is, a, is simply belief or faith in God's word and taking him at his word. But what are some things that might be able to help you in that process, in that pathway? One of the things that I recommend is reading the Word of God and studying the Word of God from the standpoint of discovering evidences of God's love for you. Read the Bible with the eye to look for evidences of god's love for you and so you know when john three sixteen says for god so love the world okay well write that down for god loved me so much that he gave his only begotten son that if i believe in him i don't have to perish but i can have everlasting life put it in your own words make it personal um <laughs> The next verse, in verse 17, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn me, but that through him I might be saved. That's another evidence of his love. Um, what other evidences of his love are there? Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Fear not, and be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Um, bless the Lord on my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord on my soul and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that you, your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He he does not treat us as our sins deserve, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. That's in Psalm 103. So you go through the Bible and you find evidences of his love and you write them down. Write them down. Keep a journal. Write them down in there, the different evidences of his love, evidences of his love, evidences of his love, and go back frequently to those evidences. Meditate on them. Think about what it means for you. And is it true for me now? God, are you, is, is this true for me now? Right? 
Another thing that helps me is recognizing that what is written is not just a historical account of something that happened in the past. The Bible is not just a historical record of what has happened in the past. It is the voice of God spoken to me personally now. Because when God wrote those things, he anticipated me and you. And he anticipated our trials and our difficulties and our problems. And he put the solution for him that for those things in there. He put the answers in the word already. It's there. Go looking for it. Find it. Write it down. And then keep going back to it. And at times when you forget it, go back and remind yourself of the promises of God's word. And as you do so, and you keep going back to it, and you keep going back to it, and you keep going back to it, you know what? There's a law of the mind. And that law of the mind is by beholding, we become changed. So if that's what you're going to, and that's what you're beholding, and that's what you keep coming back to, then your mind is going to change. You're going to begin thinking in that direction. And, and it will become more and more natural. Now, is this saving yourself? No, it's not saving yourself. You can't save yourself by any method or anything of that nature. But it's seeking to connect. And you have to connect with the vine or else the branch is going to die. And, and so, okay, spend time with him. Study. Yeah, that's right. Be real with him in prayer. That's right. I mean, you, you want to curse him up one side and down the other? You can. He's, he's heard it all before. There's not a word that you can come up with, a curse word or a combination of curse words that he hasn't heard before. And, you know, there are people that have been drunk and they've been drugged and they've been all that kind of stuff, but they've been praying. And God's still listening. You know, then somebody's going to say, well, he doesn't regard the, you know, the prayer. He doesn't hear the prayers of those who regard iniquity in their heart. Well, yes, yes, I understand that, that passage, but most people don't understand what that passage means. What does it mean to regard iniquity in my heart? Well, it means that I am holding on to that sin and I am not going to let it go. I'm not letting it go. Mm -mm, no, you cannot have this. So, Lord, please save me from the consequences of this thing that I'm holding on to and I won't let go of. Please help me not to get the consequences of this. And please help me not to suffer from those consequences of it. But you can't have it. That's regarding iniquity in my heart. And sure, if you're going to hold on to it and you're not going to let it go, well, you can, you can pray all you want to. You know, don't let me get the consequences of this thing. Eh, it's not going to work. Because there's always cause and effect. And God's not going to suspend cause and effect. So sure, be real with him in prayer. Talk with him as you would talk to a friend. Yell at him if you need to. That's okay, he can take it. Just keep talking to him. And go to his word and find evidences of his love for you. And get it and write it down and write it down. And, follow, you know, and just keep coming back to it. Keep coming back to it. And that will help you in the process. Other questions? If not, that's fine. We can close for today. And then we'll be back again. Same time, same place. And if you have missed um, other, and I mentioned that earlier, but if you have missed other um, group sessions, um, <clears throat> then <clears throat> uh, you can find those on New Paradigm Ministries YouTube channel. Um, and uh, the presentations at the beginning of each one have been cut off from some of them so that you have just that that you can access. And also there was a sermon that was posted just recently from this last weekend that really stirred the church. And uh, we just got a message that, you know, the church has really been talking about it and, you know, things have been flying back and forth and ideas that came up from um, <clears throat> what... Uh, what was presented there on health by faith and so it's something that you might want to check out all right we got some here do you think that we should become so filled with god's love that we don't need anyone else in our life <clears throat> all right so that's the all right let me let me clarify that question and answer it um do you think that we should become so filled with god's love that we don't need anyone else as a source 
in our life? And the answer to that question is yes. And that's exactly where we all need to be. Uh, we need to be in a place where we have God as our source and no one else. No one else. Now, others can be a channel of God's love and his grace. You know, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of heavenly lights with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. And so if there's any good that comes to us through any avenue, then it came from God. He's the source of it. And it's okay to take good that comes through another individual, but recognizing that it's coming from God. And so my dependence is upon God, not on the individual. That's okay. <clears throat> But the moment that I turn to the individual as my source, as the one that I need, now I'm in trouble and all hell is going to break loose in some way, in some fashion, it's going to be bad. So should we become so filled with God's love that we don't need anyone else as a source in our life? Yes. But do you, do you think that we should become so filled with God's love so that we don't need anyone else to give to in our life? No. And that's where many people get mixed up when it comes to uh, the Genesis account and God's statement that it's not good that man should be alone. It was not. Um, <clears throat> it was not. And what should I say? God had Adam alone before he created Eve. I mean, everything else, he created them together. He created all the animals together. He created all the plants together. He created all the other things together. But when it came to humans, he created Adam without creating Eve. Why? <clears throat> to show Adam that God was his source and that God had everything that he needed and he could be completely content and fulfilled by taking from God and God alone. But what was missing? Well, you can talk to your dog and you can talk to your cat and you can talk to your pets and, but you can't, you can't relate to your cat and your dog and your pets in a way that is really meaningful so that you can communicate to them things that are deep in the way that you can think. You have to have something else of your same nature that can think that deeply and have the same capacities in order for you to be able to share those things with so that they can get it and understand it and there can be that com community. Yeah. And Adam didn't have that. It wasn't that he was deficient and he didn't have what he needed because there wasn't an Eve. No, God created everything that Adam needed before Adam came. And he didn't create Eve before Adam. Yeah. <clears throat> so he created Eve later. Now, why did he put Adam to sleep? I mean, he could have kept Adam alive. I mean, he could have kept him awake. I mean, how, how hard would it be for God to reach into Adam's side, take out a rib without any pain, without any surgery or anything like that, just pull out a rib and then form Eve and do all that kind of stuff. And then Adam could watch God creating another human being. Wouldn't that be cool? But no, he put him to sleep. Why? So that Eve could have alone time with God without Adam, as far as she knew, was a lump of something on the ground over there. And, uh, and and so she had alone time with God so that she too could know that God was everything that she needed and that she was, that he was sufficient for all of her needs. But she too didn't have anything of the same nature for her to relate to what God was telling her and how she could have, you know, because God created us for community. Right? So when he woke Adam up, now they met each other. Now they had someone of a similar nature that they could express and they could give to what they were taking from God and understanding and have that community. That's what God created us for. He created us as communal individuals or as, as social beings, right? But it's not for the other person to be our source. It's for God to be our source, but for us to give to others and for us to take 
from God through them, right? So good can come through them from God. So for example, like somebody says, um, what does it mean by other people can be a channel? Why did God give family and community, right? So I think we're partially answering that right now. Um, so to be a channel, for example, I have read the Bible and different promises, and uh, and I have read other things, and I've come to understand a bit of how the human nature works and so on. And so I am sharing those things with you at this time. And so as that, I am functioning as a channel of God and his truth to you. And to the degree that it is truth and is the degree to which it comes from God, if there's any error, it's not coming from him. It's coming from me and the enemy, right? And, um, and so you can receive the truth as is in harmony with the word of God as coming from him, even though it might be coming through my mouth and expressions and, you know, and other things like that. But if it's true, then he's the source. So depend upon him. Don't depend upon me. Um, do, 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 do. very thought provoking presentation. Uh, I mean, like we will never feel lonely for fellow human beings to do things with. No. Right. And I think I answered that already. No, you would it, to share with, right. And to express with, um, and plus as we share and grow, we grow more like, uh, more like God. Yes, that's true. Good stuff. All right. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, tomorrow we should have this up on uh, the the YouTube channel as well, uh, so that you can go over this again, uh, as you mentioned. And uh, so that should be available for you there. And if there's anything else, if there's particular topics that uh, you would like to be covered, uh, we'll get to some. Some have mentioned a few topics that we need to get later because we got to build more of a foundation before we get to some of the specific topics. But if there are specific ones that uh, you would like covered, then just uh, email us. Um, and uh, you can, that's info at npmen.org. I just stuck that down in the chat. Um, so go ahead and email us uh, those questions. Camelin. You got um, mm -hmm. So I was just listening to Desire of Ages a few days ago, um, and it has a quote in He Ordained the Twelve. Um, As his representatives among men, Christ does not choose angels who have never fallen, but human beings, men of like passions as those they seek to save. Christ took upon himself humanity that he might reach humanity. Divinity needed humanity, for it required both the divine and the human to bring salvation to the world. Divinity needed, oh wait, um, yeah, mm -hmm. humanity, that humanity might afford a channel of communication between God and man. So with the servants and messengers of Christ, man needs a power outside of and beyond himself to restore him to the likeness of God and enable him to do the work of God. But it, this does not make the human agency in, unessential. Humanity lays hold upon divine power. Christ dwells in the heart by faith. And through cooperation with the divine, the power of man becomes efficient for good. So just that talking about being a channel. Yeah. Um, and that humanity is needed in that we need contact with each other to see a picture of god yes <clears throat> i mean god uses uh god uses that channel he has ordained that channel um <clears throat> did oh did jesus did jesus need the disciples for himself in order for him to go through or was he desirous of their staying up and praying and watching and that kind of stuff especially talking about the garden of gethsemane and the you know through the trial and crucifixion and so on 
did, did he need them for himself or was he desiring their sympathy not so that he could have their sympathy but so that he could know that they were sympathetic so that they could survive the trial who was his motivation for well it was for them because obviously he didn't get their sympathy they didn't stay up and watch and pray with him and he went through he trusted wholly in his father but he was wanting to bring them through well as well but unfortunately they didn't and he knew that they wouldn't he predicted that they wouldn't um, but he was still trying to give them every chance every opportunity for them to get through well and so that's the nature of god he's always doing what he's doing for others for their good for their sake and that's a god you can trust and that's a god you can love All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to pray. And then uh, we'll plan on next week, 6.30 Central Time. Same, same connection link uh, each time. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what an awesome God. Wonderful God you are. Thank you. And uh, Lord, as we consider these things, our upside downness and the deception, the craziness, um, Lord, help us to see uh, that, that we've got an issue, we've got a problem, and we need help. And we might not understand every way of being free right now. But Lord, we believe that you love us and you have a way to set us free. We want that freedom. We want to be like you. And so, Lord, we thank you for not giving up on us. And we thank you <clears throat> for providing simple means for us that we might be free. For by grace, we have been saved through faith. That not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, because if it was, we would boast. <laughs> we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God ordained for us to do in advance. Oh, praise God for your grace. And thank you for giving us the faith by which to grab hold of that grace, that we might be saved. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.